नमस्कार टू दी फर्स्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव पार्टिसिपेंट्स ऑफ माय प्रोग्राम डेविड एस जस एंड एस सुनिक ही कम्स वी विल गो थ्रू द वेबिनार डेविड हिल्सन बिफोर आई ही कम्स आई लाइक टू मेंशन इट इज़ लाइक मच टू इंट्रोड्यूस हिमसेल्फ मच मच टू इंट्रोड्यूस हिम ही इज़ राधर मॉडेस्ट पर्सन बट आई मस्ट टेल यू दैट टुडे इन माय ओपिनियन ही authorities in the field of risk management if you see youtube you will find over 150 video clippings of his lasting from 7 minutes to hour and a half so we are very privileged ladies and gentlemen that he is with us and i'm very happy that all of you could spare time uh, today so with this i just i was just introducing to you david that how many video clippings you have on youtube over 150 and so many articles and i was just saying to my participants that today uh, you have you are one of the foremost authorities on this management and no wonder everybody calls you this doctor so there are a lot of patients nowadays in the world and maybe you have a this doctor group which you have created so these people nowadays i'm sure you are very busy nowadays because patients are coming very very you well, you're very kind you're very kind thank you so much uh, adesh it's a it's a great pleasure to be uh, alongside you in this way and um, yes there's a lot of uh, a lot of patients coming to my surgery just now but what i'm trying to do is to offer um prescriptions that suit everybody rather than one at a time i think uh, what we're hoping in this in this webinar is to offer prescriptions that lots of people can can benefit from that's right you are very you're today you are generic concepts which you are going to bring so with this let me just set up a small background introduction and then of course i will ask uh um, david to speak so let me set up the the with three four ppts set up the tone of the of the webinar i hope you are able to see the ppt the hope for a better world or hope for the better world as we emerge from the covid-19 pandemic the title is invented by david hilson and together i thought out of four titles he suggested and this was perhaps the most most relevant in today's context now let me just give you a very brief introduction about what is happening the novel corona virus a tiny micron has brought the entire world to a grinding halt and to their need globally 14.5 million at least persons are affected with over 600000 deaths remember these figures are documented figures a stanford guru whom i'm going to quote you it would be mind boggling if you see how many people are already affected which are not reported this world will never be the same as before covid-19 made us less egoistic this has taught us that we think that we are mighty mighty people one micron can teach you please do not think that the second one which i want to show you here is the underprivileged and that i think we have responsibility we may not be in that category but it is our responsibility to see them and that's what It means to be human being. The underprivileged and economically weak are most impacted, especially in underdeveloped countries. Partly true in advanced countries as well. Developed countries, where the local people, local income group, are more mostly impacted. In comparison to the others, the third one, which I want to show you here, exploring new options. Now, this is important. And this is what I have discussed with David in a couple of our exchange of mails. 
Let me, what are the threats? What are the opportunities? What are the options we have today? As a human race, it's not issue of me and you, it's the issue of the planet Earth. So exploring new options coupled with collective wisdom, collective wisdom and exploration of our mindset, our mindset for new ways to tackle the threat of survival must be fully exploited. The collectivism, the collective, collectivism. One more slide, I just want to show two more PPTs. Human race has survived and prospered in spite of massive setbacks through the ages. We had a lot of setbacks. Spanish flu, plague, at that time we were not so advanced uh, in the time of plague. Perhaps it's a part of our DNA, the human being's DNA to face challenges and move forward. And we, are, we have indomitable spirit. The human beings cannot be defeated. We will win over COVID in this devil small micro. Innovative framework, framework of mind is what is going to be basically our collective work. The pandemic has highlighted, highlighted the links between the environment health, human beings, human beings, and the economy. We see major consequences on economy, society, and mental health. Worldwide countries significantly impacted by COVID, but the pandemic also provides an opportunity. And that's what David was saying in one of my conversation, that I think we should be looking at more opportunities, a positive side of what is happening because everybody in the media, everybody in the newspaper, everybody you talk about deaths and deaths and so much million, and you feel such a negative. You feel as if you're going to die, actually. There should be a positivism, collectivism to say, hey guys, you're going to win. It's a football match, you're going to score. So I would say the opportunity to mankind, which we will share together, to wake up, to create a new world order, balancing planet, people and profit. When I say profit, it means economy. One more slide just to end this known data point. The whole, the whole human race, the three colors will vary. In the old age, in the tribal age, in the primitive age, the green will be much less. Everything will be more red because we don't know when the line will come and catch us. So the coloring system itself is changing as we progress in time, green and yellow and red. So known data points, yellow is data analytics. Today we live in the digital age, internet age. We have to have all satellites all over us. We should be able to analyze the data for the betterment of the society and human being. And the last one is what we see in pandemic, possibility and not problem. We do not deal with probability, we deal with the possibility. So this is all what I want to share, set up the tone. And now, I, as I mentioned to you, Dr. David Hilson, I have personally met him two years ago, but I have known him for the last 15, 20 years to our common association, in the PM, Global PM Advisors, and appreciating each other's work in respective areas. And we had offered him and conferred him as the already fellow of CPM in 2018 and uh, for his contribution to make the society better. He has been talking about a lot through his videos and all about swan, black swan, whether the pandemic is a black swan, swan or is not. And he has made a lot of videos. Now may I now request before we talk about the theme of the webinar to give him five to six minutes his perspective, whether COVID-19 is a black swan or not. David, it's you now. Thank you, Adesh. Um, but this question of black swans is very interesting. Um, a black swan is a kind of jargon uh, phrase, which is used um, in, in quite, quite widely um, to talk about a particular type of risk. And the black swan idea came from this book. Um, it was published in 2007 by a man called Nassim uh, Nicholas Taleb, you probably can't see the name. Um, but in this book, he talks about um, the impact of the highly improbable. 
And what he says is that black swans are a particular category of risk. Now, a lot of people get confused and use the terms in the wrong way. And some people are saying, well, clearly the coronavirus pandemic uh, comes under the category of what Taleb is calling a black swan. And I'd like to suggest to you that that's not true. And the reason that it's not true is not just because there's a piece of risk-related jargon that isn't applicable, but it relates to the way that we approach this pandemic and also future pandemics and future things that could affect us globally in a really significant way. So Taleb says that, that uh, black swans have three characteristics. First of all, they are entirely unpredictable and unknowable. You cannot imagine the thing that happens. It emerges from a dark place, from a, from a, a place of mystery, a place of unknown, and we could not have imagined it. We could not have predicted it. The second characteristic is that it has an extreme impact. And the third uh, characteristic that Taleb uses is that once it's happened, we look back and we say, of course, we should have seen this coming. Uh, and there are lots of uh, examples that he gives in, in this book. But I'd like to say that the coronavirus pandemic is absolutely not a black swan because it was entirely predictable. It was knowable in advance. And not only was it predictable, it was predicted. So we did have a global um, flu-based uh, coronavirus pandemic 100 years ago in 1918. It was called the Spanish flu, and it infected the world and 50 million people died. It was an absolute disaster. And since then, people have been aware of the possibility that another similar global pandemic could occur. And there's been lots of discussion um, over the, the, the last 20, 30 years, uh, and probably a little bit longer, to say the world needs to prepare for another Spanish flu. And I just want to give you a, a few highlights of, of some of uh, the places where we have seen the coronavirus pandemic coming. Um, the UK has a national risk register. I'm based in England. And so the UK national risk register was started in 2007. And the very first issue of that had a global pandemic, an influenza pandemic, as a top risk. And the quote was, experts agree there is a high probability of another influenza pandemic occurring, although we cannot forecast its exact timing or the precise nature of its impact. In October 2016, the UK government hosted Exercise Cygnus. And here is the, the start of the report. The Cygnus report in October 16 was specifically looking to see how the UK government would respond to a major flu pandemic in the UK. And the results highlighted big gaps in our emergency preparedness. Um, a few years later, in 2019, um, the London, uh, the, the city of London had a, its own risk register. This is dated January 2019. Um, the uh, pandemic influenza was the second highest risk after a failure of the uh, transmission network, the electricity transmission network. They said a worldwide outbreak of influenza um, could affect up to 50% of the population of the UK with up to 750,000 750, fatalities. This was predicted in 2019, if we did nothing. Um, then we had the world, more recently, the world at risk. Uh, this report was published in September 2019 by the uh, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. Um, here they said that um, the world is not prepared. I'm quoting here for a fast moving respiratory pathogen pandemic. Um, if, a, if a similar contagion occurred today, similar to 1918, 50 to 80 million people could perish. And in addition, a pandemic could cause panic destabilize national security and seriously impact the global economy. And this report makes seven recommendations to, to, to global governments, none of which were implemented, not one. Now, I think uh, we, we have to learn something from this. People are looking to me as a risk professional and saying, why didn't you tell us this was coming? And the answer is, we did tell you this was coming but you didn't do anything about it. And the question is, how do we respond to these kinds of warnings in future? And that will be something that we need to think about. Um, so I would say quite clearly, the coronavirus pandemic is not a black swan because it was not only predictable, but it was predicted. However, as we'll perhaps talk about a little bit uh, more, Adesh, between us, 
there are unexpected risks which emerge from the blacks from the pandemic now that it's happened i would say there is one clear black swan something that we really didn't see coming that's come out of the pandemic and that is the global lockdown so when my my wife and I were uh, in Africa. We spent some time in Africa in January and February and March of each year. And in February, when the, uh, the pandemic started to emerge in China, China locked down the city of Wuhan and Hubei province. Uh, and uh, I turned to my wife and I said, that could happen in China, a complete lockdown. That would never happen anywhere else. We couldn't have that in Europe. We couldn't have that in the UK. And three weeks later, there was a lockdown in the north of Italy. And I turned to my wife and I said, that's a surprise, lockdown in Italy, but of course it could never happen anywhere else. And now we've had two thirds of the world's population in some form of lockdown. That I believe was unforeseeable. And that has been a black swan that we're struggling to respond to. And some countries, and of course India is, is amongst those, is still in the middle of that, uh, of that crisis. But I think um, although the, black, the uh, coronavirus itself is not a black swan, there are real risks which we can and must see and respond to proactively which emerge from it. And maybe, Adesh, you and I can talk about what some of those things might be. What are the risks that arise from the coronavirus pandemic now it's happened? Adesh, you're still muted. Adesh, you will need to... Un I listen to you, I always behave as a student and a good student who believes in listening and listening. I'm sorry, I could put the unmute. I'm going to show you before I respond to your extremely relevant question, how to balance and the risk which we are facing today. I will also take a little bit help of the PPTs uh, to show you my ideas about the risk. And this would be this part. Just, and this is going to come a little bit after two, three things, the question which you raised. As per the world population, breathes polluted air. Silver lining, of course, the positive side of pandemic is that the wide lockdowns have had a positive impact on rejuvenating planet Earth. The place where I stay, I see in the morning birds singing, six o'clock. I can see sky clear. I can see stars. So, you know, this is a positive side of it. But as you ask the question about the rest, I'll come to that. We are again seeing blue skies, CO2 emissions are down significant. I'll let me put it in the animation mode, actually. I was not putting in the animation mode. And this is silver line. The third one is we are again seeing blue skies in all this I mentioned to you. Now this is a strategy which will come later on and Gabriel will also show his views how to overcome this massive disaster. Integration as a policy, global integration and not division, not nationalism. Me first. Those days are gone into play when we face a common enemy, at the enemy which cannot be seen. These are saboteurs, invisible enemies. How do we work with them? So unless there's a global community, we will not be able to do that. How? Now this is a very interesting point I especially made today. And when we will look into the risk mitigation, hope is not a strategy. Hope, I hope it will happen. We must have we must have an effective strategy to materialize our goal. Many people will say something will happen, and that is again a risk in the mindset of the people that they are not taking it so serious. Something will happen. Oh, that's not going to be important. It's a big risk, David, to me, that mindset provides a very big risk in today's circumstances. We need a global strategy, as I mentioned before, again, for cooperation in research and in public health to deal with the current pandemic and prepare for my, for any such catastrophes in the future. We have seen this, that public 
how many loopholes we see in the public health system in developing and developed countries. In today's digital age, this is very important. I'm not going to be politicizing this particular bullet, but if you can, you can, I will leave it to your imagination as how the information flow gets connected with everything we do. In today's digital age, information flow should be instantaneous whenever we face a pandemic like COVID-19, could be any pandemic, disaster, water floods, earthquakes, the time has to be very important. Delay in information sharing can result in multiplying issues exponentially. So I think this is our mindset. Again, it's a risk, David, that we are not going to react fastly. Let me see something for me before I say something else. Adesh, can I ask you, what are the words at the top of your slide, the Vasudeva Katumbakam? What is that? Can I ask you, what are the words at the top of your slide? Okay, sorry, I should have, I, sorry. Vasudeva Kutumbakam is gonna come later on, but thank you very much. Vasudeva Kutumbakam is a Sanskrit word uh, thousands of years ago when it, when we thought, human beings, the people, Indians, thought the whole world is a family. The whole world is a family. And classically speaking, they have included not only human beings, but including any living beings. They are all part of the family in a larger perspective. But we don't look at larger perspective. We say the whole world is a family. Vasudev, Vasudev, Kutumbukam, Kutumbukam, Kutumbukam means family, was a Sanskrit word for the earth, for the, the whole earth, we, we have like it. Thank you for Thank asking. You. Thank you. This is a mitigation strategy, but because of that thing, if I had an hour to solve problem, I would spend 55 minutes thinking about problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. But this is exactly what you have been preaching a long time, that how do we look at risk? from a global perspective, next, all kinds of issues. And you perhaps will talk about later. And I think this has caught my attention that very, very often when we look at the risk, we just don't look at the holistic picture. We look at some parts and we say, hey, these are the risks here. But when you look at integrated way, the risk will be many much more important. And this is the last two slides I'm gonna show you before we come back here. It was Dev Kutumukam. It is written in the Sanskrit word. There it was in English. The whole world is a family. Now this is hope for a better world. This is interesting. I only did it yesterday. It's nothing very, very new. And I just want to show you, this is your five elements which Indian philosophy talks about. The earth, the air, the ocean, the fire and the space. These are the five elements which makes the planet. So this is one part when we look at planet. It's the planet, family of all kinds, kings and queens and beggars, brown and yellow, white and any number. So you know, combination of people, female, child, they're all part of this family, human beings. The third part is the economy, the profit, planet, people, profit, economy. These are the economies grown. So here, in my opinion, which I'll talk later, this is not relevant right now, so I'm not going to apply it to you, but it will come back to you later on the slide. Mm. This is very interesting to me. Earlier in the evolution of human race, brain adopted to ensure physical survival. Now in pandemic reality, the risk is, there's a risk that we have to challenge the brain is to ensure its own survival. The brain has to survive. And how do you change your brain when you become 50, 60, 40? There is a time constant, there is a, there's inertia. This inertia, as you said, David, is a risk to handle. 
So I would say in this particular statement, the greatest challenge to us is to change the way we think by acting fast in the digital and disruptive unknown world. And this I will come later on the strategy, how do we do this? So at this time, I will stop your mm. uh, particular thing. I think that's really very interesting, Adesh, and uh, to, to take that bigger picture, and you introduced the word hope, which uh, is in the title of our, of our discussion, and somebody put in, in the chat box, you know, I really need some hope. Um, and I think there are a number of ways we can help people to generate hope. One is with the bigger picture, which you've begun to introduce, and, and we'll come back to in just a moment. Um, but the other, I think, is in the more tactical area. Um, in, in what's coming in the next three months, six months, 12 months, as well as where we might be going in the next two, three, five, 10, 50 years. Um, and so in terms of um, some tactical things, I think I'd just like to introduce the idea, and, and you talked about needing a change of mindset, that risk arises, uh, risk is about uncertainty that can affect our objectives. Uh, so I define risk as uncertainty that matters. Lots of uncertainties don't matter, they're not risks. The risks are the uncertainties that matter. Um, and uh, in terms of mindset, risk arises from uh, conditions that we have which are already in existence, one of which is the coronavirus pandemic. So that is a certainty, but out of the certainty of the pandemic, uncertainties arise. And in terms of a change of mindset, we really need to see that not all those uncertainties are bad. One of the things we've learned in the world of project management and business over the last 20 years, uh, and in fact, it's been a much, much longer term um, of view over thousands of years, actually, is that not all risk is bad, <clears throat> that some risk, if we embrace it, can create additional benefits, can create uh, better and faster ways of achieving our objectives, um, not just threats, but also opportunities. And in terms of generating hope for the short term, I think we need to encourage people to think that the risks that come out of the coronavirus pandemic are not all bad. Yes, of course, we'll find that some people will lose their jobs, some people, uh, whole areas of, of, um, of industry will find it difficult to recover, um, hospitality, uh, transport, aviation, um, these sorts of uh, parts of industry could find it very difficult um, to recover. And there are some bad things which we need to think about. But there are also potential good things, potential opportunities and upsides which could come from this pandemic. And you mentioned one, which is the, the way that the pause in our economic activity has helped the planet in terms of reducing emissions, in terms of reducing travel, uh, in terms of allowing the world to breathe again. Um, and, and I've been like you, listening to the birds in my garden and uh, breathing the fresh air and the, and the peace when there aren't cars going by all the time and airplanes going overhead, it's wonderful. Um, how can we include that in the way that we build back after the pandemic, after lockdown? How can we build back better? And I think uh, what we need to do is recognize some of these opportunities, but we're not definitely going to get the opportunities unless we see them and, and uh, respond to them proactively. So threats are uncertainties in the future that might happen and would hurt us unless we do something about it now. And so the idea is to prevent, avoid, mitigate, reduce threats. But opportunities are also uncertainties in the future that could help us, that could bless us, that could grow us, but they're not certain. And we have to respond to them now and be proactive in order to capture them, exploit them, enhance them, improve their possibilities of occurring. And so I'd like to, as part of the, the call for hope, to say to people, yes, we have a terrible condition. The, the world is, is suffering from the pandemic and the, the aftermath, the, the lockdowns, the health challenge, the economic challenge. And there are uncertainties which are coming down the track which could hurt us that we need to see and respond to. But also there are uncertainties ahead of us which could be really helpful that we could embrace. And I'd like to suggest that those things occur at the personal level in the way that we that we are individually in the way we treat our health in the social level the way we respect our key workers the way we look after our vulnerable neighbors the way we treat people uh, in society um, and also at the national level uh, as you've touched on um, that the world is a family and we can't anymore have isolationism uh, we have to think about our supply chains what do we bring home what do we share 
And I think a lot of these things are opportunities that if we don't do anything, we'll just drift away. But if we see them and we respond to them proactively in a coordinated and energetic way, we can capture some of those opportunities in the same way that we hope to avoid and minimize and mitigate some of those threats. So for hope, I think, yes, of course, there are bad things that we need to stop, but there are also good things that we need to act now in order to capture. I'm sure you agree. Very good, very, very good. Excellent, excellent. I just wanted to continue with your take further to what you have said, and I entirely agree with what you have said. And let me again show some of the things which you have said. Fortunately, I also believe in the same as the, again, let me share this with you and come back to the slide. This is the slide. And I think this is a, this is a very, in my opinion, uh, before that, let me see. This is, I want to start. This is very, very, I mean, I've used this slide since the last eight years. All the coloring scheme keeps on changing, the font size keeps on changing. And I really believe the dynamic adjustment of vision, just a small part of the whole most complex human system, just a very tiny, small part. Look at the beauty of our creation. I, long distance, it adjusts focal length. Medium distance, it adjusts focal length. Reading, it adjusts focal length. Dynamic, long distance, it adjusts. New, natural lens adjusts the focal length depending on the distance, variable focus. Do we have that in our mind? Do we create that? that our mind is not only looking short term or long term, short term gain, long term loss. I mean, how do we adjust these three uh, components? And you see the next slide, which I suggest, I've added up these, these three things uh, for this only. They were for project management, the writing which you see here were different, but I have changed these things to suit today's event. Now look at the mind, our mind, can we look at global perspective first? Then we look at regional perspective, Asia, Europe, America. And then we look at our national perspective, UK, India, China, Bhutan, Nepal, African countries, some of our good countries. Can we adjust that? Can we look at that? My very strong belief is unless we see the whole, if we concentrate here, we are myopic. We can only read books. We cannot see sky. So this is the relationship in the whole and parts. Hope is very strong. This pandemic has taught us. It cannot be a, a exercise of one nation. We've got to bring everybody on board. And therefore, I quote one of my favorite author, Dr. Harari, one of the finest historian. He did a lot of work in the University of Oxford. David will know personally the work he has done. He says, and I bring that very clearly, knowledge is useless unless it changes your behavior. I agree. We can all learn. We can go through a thousand webinars. We can do every learning. And learn. But where are we changing our mind? How the inertia of mind should be reduced so can we move? If the inertia of mind is so much, it does not allow you to move at all. And into A, mass into acceleration is force. The mass is too heavy, the mental mass. Where is the acceleration? So Dr. Harare is saying, changing the behavior, doing some action. Believing in discontinuity, this is my, uh, I've just quoted him, but these are my uh, pictorial, Discontinuity is disruption has taught us, it's not continuous. And we, a lot of us believe, as David mentioned, it's not a black swan, 
lot of these reports were given, a lot of these things way back in 2007. They said, whatever is happening is great, all right, it will continue the way it is. Future is the extension of today, but future is not the extension of today. That's right. Otherwise, future will not be called future, it will be called present. Future is discontinuous to come. The one which is my end part two, just before we come to the next part. So this is what I just wanted to supplement what you have said, Devon. I think that's that's really important, and to keep the bigger picture and the detail. And one of the, <coughs> one of the things, um, and, and uh, one of the things we want to do in this webinar is to try and share together the wisdom of the East and the West, and to bring together different perspectives in order to create something which is useful to everybody. And I think that idea of the long term, the, the long perspective and the medium perspective and the, cl the close perspective is really important. And that's why when we're talking about risks, we talk about risks in relation to objectives. So the objective is our long term goal, but we have to manage the detail down here in order to get there. And so people who are interested in risk management or in project management or in business or in national security or in, in, in global business have that dual perspective of what we're trying to get to and the detail of how we're going to get there. So I think that that ability to dynamically adjust our focus is really, really important. And uh, in terms of that sort of wisdom, um, I think the question is knowing when to apply which perspective. Sometimes we have to take the, the big, big picture and, and focus on what our goals are and where we're going. And, and, and sometimes we have to stop and say, no, this piece is important. And I need to work out how to, to make this piece work in order to get to, to, to the bigger goal. So how do you think, Adesh, in terms of wisdom, we can make that decision to use the knowledge to change behavior? Wisdom is embodied knowledge, isn't it? Where we, right. where we, we, we build it into the way that we think right. Right. so that we act differently. So if we want to try to, to, to maintain both the long perspective and the close perspective and switch between them appropriately in order to change our behavior, in order to create hope for the future, what wisdom can we draw on to help us to, to, to decide where to focus? Again, I'll take help of this uh, uh, site. And uh, because I know these questions, I was expecting some of this thing from you. So let me see where I wanted to show you. Uh, this is the one. Second part, I did not, not this, not this. I think. I'll come to I'm that. This is a great slide, Adesh. I think there's so much in this. And uh, I, I, I think you've done something in bringing together the, the, the people and the planet and the, the economy uh, in a really important way. David, I must share with my all colleagues here. Somehow, I am a great worshipper of symbolic of learning, goddess Saraswati. In all these six continents, including America, Europe, Australia, Middle East, I start my training program. Mm -hmm. Three minutes, Vandana. Saraswati is symbolic of learning. I was doing a very important program Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is finished last night, eight o'clock. And I was so much harassed. And I said, David is on the other side, the risk doctor, and I'm panelist with him. How can I be trying to be equal to him? So this message came to me and my colleague Rakesh, I told him yesterday at eight o'clock, using the black whiteboard, which we had disconnected. This is what I want. He finished his first try at one o'clock. 1.30, my, I slept at 1.30 this morning again, modified this. This is all something which comes from the outer space. I don't know what it is. Mm. Well, Adesh, let, let me just, I'm going to interrupt you because I think it's important for us to say that we're not seeking to be equal here, that we both respect one another and we both have different perspectives. But there was an American businessman, his name was Wrigley, and he said, if two people think the same, one of them is unnecessary. 
If two people think the same, one of them is unnecessary. We think differently. We come from different contexts. We have different experiences. And that's what makes our interaction valuable. So, so I think the, the key thing here is equal respect. And, uh, and of course, we're different. And that's what makes this interesting. So, so I, I don't ex I, I'm not equal to you. And you're not equal to me. Now, I said today these three holes, people, people, planet, there's one positive. Maximum positive you can go is three, 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 everywhere. Shows two, but three, three, one is common to everybody. Three positive, three positive, three positive. So there's one positive out of three, just for the sake of usage, one third where we could go. Here is, instead of three positive, we are one negative. We are in a bad shape. Global warming, Siberia having 38 degree temperature, ocean rising. We are blind to the climate change. Peter Morris keeps on telling me, a great friend of mine, a great thinker, Dr. Peter Morris, David knows him well. He keeps on saying, Adesh, the project management community has failed to recognize the environment, sustainability in their charter. And he contributed to make the charter. By the way, David is one of the 37 signatories to the World Forum, which we'll talk a little later. Now, Human beings, I say, is a zero, neither too bad. Some people are raised, a lot of people are still poverty. A lot of people have come to that level. We would say neutral, one positive, negative. What is the utopia? And the world, if all the world works together, the economy could be three plus. Solar, solar, windmills, solar, Tesla, no, hydrocarbons must be dead. They cannot survive. 10 years from now, I believe there will not be oil to be used. This sun, the planet will be so beautiful. Beautiful sun is coming. These are the beautiful things. And child is happy. No child trafficking, no child misuse, no child abuse. We responsible citizens of this world have been so, so selfish not to look at these things carefully. So a strategy for us to make sure while we are moving here, we cannot neglect this. There's contradiction between these two, contradiction between these two, contradiction between these two. Ultimately, in my opinion, the number one importance is planet, people, and the economy. Because if you do not create wealth, people will also die through hunger. So there's a relationship between wealth creation, but distribution could be more equal. I can say 20 million millionaires and 2,000 billionaires create 160 trillion economy, eight times that of the United States. So there's one divide, there has to be other part of the world which needs that kind of living being so that they can live a decent life. So my first suggestion would be do grow towards this utopia with a more sustainable planet. Do make sure education, public health systems become good to people who cannot afford to go to medicine and seeing their daughter die in front of the eyes is the most pitiable things human beings can tolerate. See their own children die because they don't have something to take care of. So I think we should look at the planet and people, but we need this economy. We have to balance. There are contradictions, but it's a challenge for us to look at challenge, hopefully. And I would just continue and just to say that's it. That's all what I wanted to say. The strategy to balance the economy. Some countries want economy to go, the school to be only open without understanding scientists, people who have dedicated their life to what could be the outcome. No, no, start opening the school. I believe everybody's right. Every human being is right. There's something positive. But we should need to balance. Balancing is what project management and risk management is all about. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's important for us to learn from one another. Um, I, you were quoting earlier from the Upanishads, which I've, of course I've read, and the Vedas and so on. And I think it's important that uh, you know, we look over the fence, uh, that we, we embrace the, the learnings from one another. Um, and uh, maybe we should at this point just talk about the um, the World Project Management Forum, 
I think uh, just in terms of the, the time that we're spending together, um, I noticed somebody said in one of the questions, uh, one of the chat boxes here, um, I hope the good doctors don't just stick with philosophy, uh, but that they give us something practical to work with. Um, and I think we've, we've talked about reasons for hope, that um, the risks that come out of the pandemic, which we'll, the world is suffering from, some of them are bad and we need to avoid them, but some of them could be good and we, can, we need to embrace them. We need to work out which are the good opportunities. And in order to do that, we need to respect both the people and the planet and the profitability of our economy. And these things we need to, to balance together. And we need to recognize that the world is, is, is a system, the world is a family, we belong together. We, we, are, we are one world, a one family, as, as you said very, very powerfully earlier. But we also need some practicalities. Um, and I would say that some of the practical techniques of risk management could be useful in terms of identifying and capturing opportunities. And we don't have time to go into the detail of what those specific things might be. Um, we'd also uh, want to say that resilience is important. You know, certainly people predicted these pandemic possibilities over the last two, three, five, ten, thirty 10, 30 years. Uh, what we need to do is to build resilience at the personal level, personal resilience, project resilience, business resilience, and national resilience. And that's, that's something that we should all be focusing on. But I think uh, the other thing to say is that there is a place in terms of building back better, practical things we can do, which, we would, uh, which would be the world of projects. And that I know is, is your own particular area, and it has been your, your passion, uh, and, and your, um, your career uh, in terms of building uh, better projects. So could we just talk about the role of the World Project Management Forum, which uh, is an initiative of yours, which you started, uh, maybe was it two years ago? I think you've got 36, 37 global signatories of uh, project management authorities around the world who support this. And I'd like to suggest that um, the World Project Management Forum might be a way of us implementing the sorts of strategies that we've been talking about, the sort of philosophy we've been talking about, the sort of change in mindset um, in order to, uh, to make a practical difference in the world. So I wonder if, Adesh, you might just share the purpose of the World Project Management Forum and the sorts of areas that you think it could be working in and how some of our participants might maybe get engaged in using the World Project Management Forum to create real hope on the ground and to build back better um, after we move out of this pandemic. Okay. All right. So let me just again show you the last part of my uh, PPT World Forum. I made it whenever. Uh, this is just a moment. I'm just going to select this. Here, David, you remember in late early 2019, last year, we have started involving all of you, I've written to you in April 2019, to about 100 global leaders, Peter Morris from World Bank, and David, David Pels, Tanaka, and all that. What should we do? Because most of the associations, they only look at operational aspect, execution, execution, execution. So based on the lot of inputs, I must say, my global friends, it's an it's a example of you. All of you contributed, and you have been one of the 37 original signatories to the charter. Charter has gone through 18 rounds of correction. I must say the 18th round was when somebody insisted from Finland that the charter Adesh is not right. Why? One thing is missing. And what is that? Sustainability and money. Peter Morris also said that, got to include, which we did, but they're so vital. So we have looked at this charter to look at the creation phase, our emphasis we should, our emphasis of creation. When we look at the creation of a fighting pandemic, we should not be rushing. We should not be rushing for making just vaccine, vaccine. What is the creation? What is the global view? How do we work together? Everybody's competing with each other. The more earlier you make vaccine, you will become billionaire. The stocks will go 100 times for that company. I mean, that's not the right thing to do creation phase. We have, we have a project to overcome. We have a project to create vaccine. 
to fight this death demand that the enemy. So this is the idea of the creation world forum. World forum will concentrate in the creation part, as you know. And you have given some ideas to us. And the title last year in December, this forum was creation aligning present to future past. Interesting. What you see in COVID, interestingly, the title was given last year, the 7th day, 9th December, but it really echoes the sentiments of what we are seeing, the present and future, aligning the creation. The vaccine is, of course, one project just like that, but there may, may be more projects like lockdown and all that. And I'm just going to show you two more slides. And I, I've taken this out of the charter. Today's dynamic, unpredictable, and disruptive, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, VUCA world requires global understanding and convergence of the cyber space, physical space, and biospace. Dot, dot, dot. And the other one which I have taken from Charter, vision realization should balance economic, social, ecological consideration, which we have talked about. The final aspects of vision realization must be integrated, integrated in meeting demands of the present, meeting demands of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is very interesting. And a lot of people globally, and we all contributed, all of us, 37 signatories, were very important to make this. And I think this is where I just uh, wanted to close on this part. And I would like to thank you for my part to give me this opportunity to work with you as a panelist. And this is what I would like to stop now with this talk. Very good. I, I hope people have found that valuable. Certainly, Adesh, I, I found it useful and, and challenging. Please, louder, because I think there are some comments coming that will speak. The voice is a little bit less audible. I think they should have told earlier. I was just told by somebody my microphone yes I, yes my microphone had slipped i'm so sorry it's my my smart tie is very shiny and my microphone had slipped away i'm i'm very sorry about that so i, I hope uh, you were able to catch some of the uh, some of the things i was uh, i was trying to say earlier on i'm so sorry about that but i did want to say adesh that um I've really found it very valuable in terms of listening to your insights and uh, and your perspective on some of these things. And as always, when you share, when together we share our ideas, they often raise more questions uh, that we also need to consider. And, and fortunately, we have had some questions uh, from people. So uh, shall we spend um, 10 or 15 minutes addressing some of those questions? W would you like to, to lead off on that? All right. So let me start with Q&A. All right, uh, we'll start from the top. Mr. VTCS Rao, you know, he is a person who is heading um, an institution, LNT Institute of Project Management, and personally a very dear, very dear friend of mine. We just finished a meeting at 11.45 when I said to VT, I, I got to prepare for my... So he says, COVID-19 is is, was, was unknown, unknown, okay? And in recent times, unknown unknowns are hitting us at wrong times, affecting us in unexpected way. Risk management is largely deals with known unknowns. How we can convert unknown unknowns to known risks so that there could be successful risk management in project. Nobody can answer better than you, David. <laughs> on to you. Well, well, let me, I think there are a couple of things to say. First of all, the coronavirus pandemic was not an unknown unknown. As I tried to explain right at the very beginning, it's a known unknown. We knew, we've known since 1918 that a global influenza pandemic, a coronavirus pandemic was possible, probable, certain. We know it would, we knew it would happen, we just didn't know when. So I think that the, the first point is, is that it wasn't an unknown unknown. But the more general point in your question is that these things are hitting us um, at, at bad times, at inconvenient times, and how can we make an unknown unknown known? Um, there are ways we can do that through experimentation, through exploration, through um, through uh, cyclic um, uh, cyclic ways of working and thinking. Um, but I think more important is to say how could we prepare ourselves 
for when an unknown unknown actually comes and hits us. And this, I think, as I tried to say a little earlier, perhaps when my microphone was not working, um, is, the, is the place of resilience. And resilience is important because something is bound to happen in the future that we hadn't thought of. It, it's inevitable. Our brains are limited. We are, despite all of our, our intelligence and our brilliance and our, our ways of learning, still there are things that are, are not conceivable to us. So there will be, and somebody's just saying, how can we pre be prepared for the next COVID? Um, this is the question. How can we? And we need to build resilience. And we need resilience at the personal level in terms of making sure that I have access to the support mechanisms I need, that I'm aware of my physical vulnerabilities and perhaps also my mental vulnerabilities, that I have support systems in place to, to keep me mentally and physically healthy. So personal resilience uh, in terms of project resilience, having appropriate contingencies and backup plans and options and incremental development in our projects. At business level, in terms of business resilience, making sure we don't put all our eggs into one basket, we say um, in the proverb, don't put all your eggs in one basket, or if you do, look after the basket. Um, what we need to do is to diversify and to make sure that we have um, ways of, of staying resilient when things change. And at the societal and national level, knowing what our goals are, knowing what, what really matters to us and making sure that we protect those things. I think resilience is the answer to Very making good. sure that we deal with these unknown unknowns. Very good. Now there's a couple of things more, but you know, the next one is from Suchandra Sinha. When, and by the way, she is my recent disciple. She's going through the batch one executive diploma in project management. And I share some ideas with you in this program, part-time, online, runaway success. We have our own studio with Goddess Society's blessings. She has been in the first batch. She has done two modules. One these, these simulations come from UK, kind of. And she says, because she wrote it 327, she got the answer automatically. So I don't have to give the answer. When we talk about global cooperation, the people of the world need to fight it out together. Simple it sounds, but not following basic precautions by global, all global citizens. Maybe a real threat, any comment. So I've said something about, you know, working together. Would you like to comment on it? Um, precautions by all global citizens. By, by, that, what, by that what she means, we are a little negligent putting mask. Some people are saying putting mask is taking away our right. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Uh, uh, as for the constitution. So, you know, I think that's what she's coming from. And she's one of my students, so I should satisfy her if you can give some comments. I, I think that's right. Um, she's from Paul India. David, she comes from a, she's a chief um, um, engineer working in Coal India, Northern Coal Field. Okay, thank you. I think the, the, the scope of the response needs to match the scope of the risk. So that if we have a small uh, risk that affects just me and, and my family, then I can manage it within my family. If I have a risk that is just within the scope of my project, then I need to involve my project team and my project stakeholders in managing it. If we have a global risk, we all need to manage it. And I think this is what Suchandra is saying here, that it, it, it's important that we all take ownership of dealing with the threats and opportunities which are arising from this pandemic. And that's why it's important that, as you said right at the beginning, Adesh, that we communicate clearly and openly and instantaneously where possible about where the threats and opportunities are, what the actions are that we need to take, and that then get some buy-in and some action uh, globally to make sure that we have global solutions. The coronavirus doesn't, it has no brain. It can't see a boundary. It doesn't know where it is in the world. It's just seeking vulnerable hosts that it can infect uh, and reproduce itself. And so all, all around the world, you can't say this is an Indian problem or an English problem or a Spanish problem, it's a global problem. And so she's absolutely right. If globally we don't follow basic pre precautions, it will be a real threat. We all need to look after each other here. And I think because, as you said again, we're a global family, we need to take responsibility from one another, for one another. All right, um, my BTC is Rao, Professor Rao, you kindly send me the link for the reports you mentioned. You can yes. all. And after you send it to me, I will send it to Professor Rao. Yes, of course. And uh, Sushindra has asked one more question, but if time permits, 
we will take a second from the same person. Otherwise, I'd like to cover more people. Uh, admin, one of the person says, this group, risk protection has almost become routine. Health risk security, risk security risk, and what have you are projected routinely, such that people have become complacent and disregard any suggestion to prioritize the warnings. Any uh, prioritize. This projection has almost become routine. Everybody is talking about mm -hmm. health, race, uh, security oh. risk, something like that. Uh, how to uh, any suggestion? So we okay. have become We keep on hearing the same thing. We become mm -hmm. insensitive. Yeah, this keeps on going. Okay, forget about. It. We only yes. talk. I think that's what the question yes. is coming. I think, um, you know, when we define risk as uncertainty that matters or uncertainty that if it occurs will affect objectives, it's really important that we maintain that link with objectives. If a risk doesn't matter, nobody will do anything about it. But if it really matters, then I will be interested in understanding the risk and dealing with it appropriately and making sure that it, I've, if it's a bad thing that it doesn't affect me or if it's a good thing that it does. And so I think a lot of... Um, the communication around risk has forgotten the tie to objectives. When we're talking about these global risks, we're talking about global health, we're talking about life and death issues here. Uh, it's really, really important. It's, it's so important that, of course, we're going to want to do something about it. And I think whether we're talking at project level, at personal level, or at global level, if we don't tie risks to objectives, we won't treat them as important, and there won't be buy-in to actually do something about them. So I would say in order to prioritize the right risks, we need to make sure that we can see how they affect our objectives and use the objectives to drive the commitment and the action. All right, I think I'll take this one from this one, one from the Q&A. Adjusting to the pandemic is one thing, it's fairly long. Uh, one thing in preventing the future pandemics is another. One of the biggest lessons we should have learned during the 1918 pandemic was to manage the same. We have, as a human race, not learned anything. We are exposed to the same situation again after 100 years. Looking forward, what are the explicit points? No explicit point wise agenda that humanity has to adopt to avoid such future pandemics. And if not avoid, enter them in a far, far better way to prevent economic and human casualties. Let me just tell you on this. I, I really believe history is not to learn from history. Yes. History is not to learn from history. And I think this is simply, I am different. I am much more strong. I can manage everything. You know, this complacency, this arrogance mm. that makes people empires, Political leadership, bureaucratic leadership, mm. which we don't want to. Yes. Because to understand, to look at history, to look at some why these reports were not implemented. Yes, yes. Bill Gates has said in 215 TED interview that this will be a major, major issue in the TED show. But why? Because the agenda of the political leadership sometimes is contrary to the well being of the people. And let me say this on air. If they want to crucify me, I'm ready to be done. Mm. I think the agenda of the leadership, understanding what can work. Asteroids can come and destroy the Earth. The global warming, everybody will be evaporated. Siberia, 38 degrees. Who are talking about it? Mm. It's a short-term view of getting the votes yes. and to be in the power. Some countries have become so strong that they have become lifetime presidents. That means I'm, all countries are good, all leadership is good. I'm not criticizing this. I salute them, the kind of management they do. So don't misunderstand them. But I'm just getting emotional about it. When the political leadership is disjointed to the welfare of the people, mm. the history is not to be learned from. Yes. And would you like to comment on that? I'm yes. really properly emotional, and I think this will all go into the air. YouTube after 10 days. So I don't mm. mind people hear that. And they say, who is this person sitting there? 
talking about what we should do. It's such as guys sitting there. What? Passion is important. We must be passionate, mustn't we? About that. if if something is not important to us, then why bother? So so I, I I salute your passion, and I think you must stay passionate, Adesh. That's something we love about you. But this question that Ram Prasad has raised is 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 very specific. It's very detailed. What are the explicit, point wise agenda that humanity has to adopt to avoid future pandemics? And and. Rampersad, this is a, a big, big question, and we don't really have the time to address it in detail now. I could say that there are multiple think tanks and future-based, futurists, futurologists, if we like to call them that, who are spending hours and days and weeks thinking hard about what we, what we did wrong this time, what we should uh, do differently next time. Um, and so some simple things like uh, making sure that we have pre-positioned in, in advance um, capacity that we need for, um, for hospitals. We have the right number of incubators, uh, not incubators, um, intensive care beds, uh, ventilators, that's what I meant to say. The right number of ventilators, the right amount of personal protective equipment, that we've got needles, that we've got masks, that, that all of those things are in place, pre-positioned. That's, that's something we didn't do this time, we must do it next time. The ability to, to develop vaccines at speed, we need to be able to do that at speed and at scale. So we need to make sure that we have those, those capacities ready. There will be another pandemic. It might be this, this, at the end of this year when in the Northern Hemisphere we have a winter, or it might be in two years or five years or 10 years, it will come. And so what we need to do is to be prepared in the way that we weren't this last time. We need to think about how we restrict um, how we apply lockdown in a more intelligent and targeted way instead of just stopping everything. Where do we need to protect ourselves? What are our vulnerabilities? And so I think um, there are some very specific lessons to be learned around the health challenge of a pandemic, which we can learn and must learn in order to make sure that we don't suffer in the same way when the next one happens, which it surely will. There is an explicit point-wise agenda to be developed. I don't think really we can we can explore it in detail here, but please be reassured. And somebody asked the question, where is the hope for the future? The hope is, as Adesh said earlier on, that, that we are very creative people, that we are still here after thousands of years because we are resilient, because we have learned to respond to the things that come and threaten us and to the opportunities that present themselves to us. And we will respond to this, but we need to think now for the future. We don't want to react we want to respond. We don't want something to come that we have to react to. We need to think about it in advance. And of course, from my professional perspective, the idea of risk management is to be proactive, is to think in advance about what might happen and to be prepared. So really, in terms of this explicit point-wise agenda, we are working on it. Very, very clever people right around the world are thinking about it. There will be some solutions. And, and in those reports that I showed you earlier on at the very beginning of our time together, there are suggestions, there are policy recommendations for governments, for companies, for international bodies, which we didn't implement, but we could for next time. And I think a lot of people will be going back over those old reports from the World Health Organization, uh, from the United Nations, from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, and saying, what did we miss there? Let's do it now so that we're ready for next time. I think there are lots of chats. We will collect all these uh, chats uh, and the Q&A. I think we'll store it and we will uh, share with David and together we will have your email. We'll be rest assured, give us about a week. We do not want, want you as a stakeholders of this webinar to go unanswered. But time is a constraint as always. If it, I will request David, some of the people who are still around if uh, we can take 10 minutes more, 10 to 15 minutes maximum. Yes. And the things I'm going to ask you. Uh, and this is from Chanchal. How does the construction infrastructure, it is now from the checkbox now we're talking about. How does the construction infrastructure and the steel industries come, come out of this situation? And these are all labor intensive and is hurting the economy. How to mitigate this? Excellent question. All questions are excellent. This is also an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Would you start and then I will also tell a little bit. 
I'd like you to start because this is not an area of my expertise and, and construction obviously I've worked with but it's not an area of my particular experience. I would say that look this is an opportunity and I think this is a I, I feel too I feel too shy and hesitant to say what I want to say but as people know me I say what I mean. What I'm saying is very clear. The world in the future will be much more chaotic 10 times, 20 times, 100 times than the world which we see in COVID-19, which itself is the largest, one of the largest disaster. The disasters are yet to come. In my opinion, what are those disasters? Automation, artificial intelligence, drivers will be off the job. There will be unemployment. People will not be reskilled. 7.8 billion people will be a lot of, again, hunger, protection. How do you do that? Today, if the economy is impacted because of labor, tomorrow, the people in the business will make sure they automate more. So that irrespective of the labor, reducing the, like Japanese have done, like many countries have done, like UK, USA, a lot of countries have reduced the income because the cost is very heavy. So Chanchalji, I'm telling you this, this is going to be nowhere, nothing can be done. We have, people have gone, migrated to their villages. They did not have a trust. We are business people. We could have given more crores and crores to keep them alive at the place where they are. Why did the community of business people did not provide trust to their labor who they have worked for them? And they were forced to go to villages because they did not have trust in the system. Mm. And let the industry go to docks. Mm. You do not provide the trust to people who work for you. So therefore, this is not going to be easy exercise, especially in the developing economies like us. People have to come back. They have started coming back. But we need to build trust, not to create bonds and money in the bank and expansion. We have to protect the people's interest first. I believe that is the answer, and that's the only way to mitigate this. Yes, okay. I, I, can I just make a contribution then? Um, I've been thinking about it as you speak, and I think construction and infrastructure are really important and will be you know, important in the future in terms of creating jobs and also creating resilient uh, national infrastructure. How do we get those people back to work? I think. There will be new ways of working which maintain some kind of social distance, the ability to, to not have to be right close together. Uh, there will be the requirement for personal protective equipment and maybe wearing masks where possible. Um, there will be the ability to, to bring A shifts and B shifts, to have people working in, in social bubbles. But I think the, the key thing will be one is vaccination and the other is testing. So if we make sure that people are tested regularly and they 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 currently don't have an infection, let them go to the to the building site. Let them stand next to somebody else who has also been tested. Let's have some bricklayers or some scaffolders who need to be working closely together, if they've been tested, and make sure that we do that regularly. So I think um, organisations are going to have to be creative, whether it's a, a hotel or a restaurant, or whether it's a construction site. Um, or whether it's, you know, whatever your business is. I think we have the creativity. Management need to earn their money now. Business owners now need to be thinking about how do I run my business safely in a COVID secure way, that's the new phrase, and construction and infrastructure is no exception. And so I think we will have to find ways of getting back to work. But some of those things, social distancing, masks, um, uh, teams in bubbles, testing, those will help us to get those industries back together. Our good friend Thomas Valenta, I know him for many years, decades. Perhaps you will be knowing him also, David. Yes. In Germany, how to distinguish bad and good effects isn't it? It's a matter of perspective. It depends whether you are a king or a pauper. It's a matter of perspective. But I think David can say something. But it's always, in any case, it's always a matter of perspective. People think differently. Community-wise, people think differently. Sector-wise, poor people think differently rich people think differently. So good or bad, how to distinguish this effect is, a, is, is the way you come from, is what place you're coming from, and the effect will be different than the others. David? I, I'm sorry, Thomas. 
but I disagree because risks are linked to objectives. So it's not whether the, whether the threat is good or bad for me, whether the impact is positive or negative on me personally, whether I perceive it as good or as helpful or unhelpful. The issue is what is my objective? And so a risk, if it has a bad effect on achieving an objective, it's a threat. A risk, if it has a positive effect on achieving an objective, it's an opportunity. And the key is how does it affect the objective? And so the perspective part of it comes because we have different objectives. But if we are clear about our objective, and when we're talking about global risks like pandemics and lockdowns and, and economic shock and so on, there is one overriding objective, which is security and, and um, uh, uh, continuity, then we can measure the effect explicitly and um, objectively against the objective. It's not a question of, of perception. I think that's this is an interesting question. That's I my would... perception. Yeah. And I agree with you. Good and bad risk, risk is for everybody. Risk does not spare color or creed. Risk is there what you said. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But this Antibar Supermanium, I think, I, I can see only BA. So I don't know what it is. Countries behave to preserve their national interest. More so after the spread of the virus. Most nations are looking inward and forging alliances only to preserve their interest more than ever. I am very, very much, I've been talking about this in various forums, including the government uh, India's forums, institutions. I think this is something we need longer discussion, but I would say, as you see my mind, you see the global, regional, national. Why national more? You may get more political voltage, outage out of it, short term, long term. I'm not going to get you all here, but there are a lot of issues. But certainly, national interest, let me tell you very clearly and loud and clear, it is universal as, as much as Newton's law of gravity, which I learned in my master's degree in control system from MIT professor, and that is in 1966. So I'm an old dinosaur. What I learned here, he said in first 501, Professor, what is good for a part? What is most optimal strategies for a part or subsystems at that time is not necessarily the right strategy for the system. The strategy optimization, the optimization the strategy shall differ from individual subsystems sub sub system to systems. Kennedy says, ask not what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. That yes. means he said the optimization of the United States of America, not optimization of individual interest. So that is going to be there. But everybody doesn't have to do that. There's so many compulsions. People like to rush for the vaccine so they can become very powerful in the future. So we'll stop at that and then we'll take one or two more and then we will, this is a very long one, I say, Ram Prashadji. Let's take a short one. I, I, I also am needing to, to wrap up soon, Adesh, so. How to sustainable financing? There is a lack of trust amongst patients. Similar to that, what the pandemic deals are many. I'm just looking at one or two more. What are the factors that create, that can create hope? from S. Arun, uh, just David very quickly, like they say, fire, fire debate. Each question, 30 seconds, that's it. In next five minutes, we'll take fire, well, fire exit uh, route, to just give you a very brief reply. What are the factors that can create hope? I think human ingenuity is important. I think the fact that, that we have risk management capability to identify and capture opportunities. Um, I think the fact that uh, this has been a major wake up call to us, it's been a shock to the system and we know we can never let this happen again. I think these things create hope for the future. But, but, but the main thing is our ability to be creative and innovative in finding solutions to new problems. That's how humanity is, has grown over the last few thousand years and, and that's how we'll continue to grow. I have hope for the future. I certainly have hope. Future will be much brighter. We will, we will work hard. We will be, posterity will be definitely, as long as we keep climate 
and sustainable environment. Exactly. Right. Economy is a lifestyle, how to balance economy and lifestyle, how to balance post COVID. Very difficult. People have to be less greedy. They cannot start economy at the cost of people. Yes. They have to balance out in a very phased manner. Life is slowly, slowly. That's what we can do. Let me just take a few more. And then he has just, to go. Just one more, Adesh, because I have another engagement. So I'm sorry, I must. Let's take one more. And then I will be with you for an additional 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, very useful. A lot of appreciations are saying thank you, Adesh Ji, and all that. Example means this is a yeah, this is important for you. And last question for you. Example of new business model, which has inbuilt resilience for a pandemic. This is your last question, David. Okay, the key about resilience, it's not about going back to what we did before. Resilience is about having a clear overriding objective. And resilience means that when it, whatever, um, uh, what's the word? Um, deforming impact comes that we can recover to a place that enables us to still achieve the same objective so the the picture i use is of taking a small boat across a bay in order to get to the other side when the wind blows and the tides come and somebody comes across you you're moving this way and this way and this way you need to keep your eye on the goal if you know where you're going you can always adjust your course in order to get there uh, it's important that we make sure that we have clear objectives as a business in terms of the business model and then we have flexibility built into our processes, built, built into our financing, built into our resourcing, built into our partnerships, our supply chain, all of those different things and that, that's understood by our stakeholders including investors and staff and everybody else, suppliers and so on, that says we will get where we need to go whatever it takes. And I think that's a business model that, that has embodied resilience. There is some really good work done on this. There's an outfit uh, based in New Zealand called Resilient Organizations. Uh, you can Google them and find them. They started up after the major earthquake there was in Christchurch um, uh, uh, 10 years ago now. Um, and I think it's important that we uh, draw on those kinds of resources to say, what are resilient organizational models uh, and, and how can we make sure that we are one of them? Thank you, David. But in my traditions, which I have believed also for the past 27 years, for every good lectures and good, like you, you know, this tradition in 2018, you got two times Guru Dakshina, three, four times, because you spoke three times. So this mm. is a Guru Dakshina, symbolic of learning. Mm. Symbolic of learning. Wow. In a virtual Guru Dakshina, you please think that it has come to your head, because knowledge is in your head. So once you receive it at your place, you let me know that you have received Guru Dakshina from all the parts. Have you received Thank it? Thank you so much. That's a, a real honor. I appreciate that. Thank you. I receive it now. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry I had to leave early. I'll leave you in Adesh's uh, capable hands. And uh, I wish you success in, in future, whatever the world may bring. There's but hope. We should do more. We should do a couple of more series of these. Let's do that. In the time to come. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank now, some of you are here. I don't mind spending 10, 15 minutes more. Um, I don't know whether you can raise hands or not here, but in the I2B2M software we use in our own studio, we have a tremendous amount of uh, flexibility to raise hands, to raise hands two times. This is what we are using for our executive diploma. So I can take up some of the questions and then share with you the most important thing we have launched on 19 June, and it has been a runaway success. And this is small, uh, I'm proud, I'm trying to tell you, you can do, download the brochure of i2b2m.com. But this was a big challenge for us during COVID time. Every year since 2011, we have part-time diploma in project management. We have been working, our academic industry council have eminent people from IIMs, IITs, L. And uh, so we were doing this program on a monthly basis, June, July, August, September, once in three days, and then we go to USA, George Washington first. So this was the biggest challenge. My IT team did a marvelous job. So we built up everything, our own studio, our own system to broadcast live. We did not use webinar software. 
which we are currently using, like Zoom or MS Team or WebEx. And today, after completing, I must say, batch one, two batches, two modules, module one on totality, module two on simulations, world-class simulations, top 20 business schools use, and batch two have also gone through two. These two batches will be combined on 24th of July. This has been a runaway success. We have innovated so many new things in the online mode that today we say we have lifted the bar of excellence. My team, my academic industry concept, all inputs came and as a team we succeeded. But now after this small commercial, just to feel proud, let me ask you, let me go through some of the questions. Are you, how do I know, can you give me some chat message? Do you want to hear or do you want to close? So please use chat message. Gaurav, can you see that chat messages coming or not? Do you want to hear in the next five, 10 minutes some of these chat questions? If you do not want to hear, I would like to also take goodbye to you. There are about, some people are visible. We'll continue some more time, all right? One person says. Thank you, sir. It's an interesting session of knowledge sharing. We can continue. Something more. If you are interested to continue, five, yes, I should have. Otherwise, if I don't hear five chat messages saying I want to, I'm closing the webinar. I'm going to count next 30 seconds. Time begins now. Five messages. We'll continue, please continue. Two message, 20 seconds have gone. 10 more, yes, we'll continue. Please go on, sir. Next, my clock starts now. Okay, let's go through the, continue, continue. Good, good, good. Now I've filled up the quota. So let's very quickly go to the small questions. In 10 minutes, we cannot go for bigger ones, all right? So kindly excuse me to all those whom I'm not able to talk to. I have your address, you can write to me. My email address is chairman at i2p2m.com. Chairman at i2p2m. I for India, numeric two, P for Peter, numeric two, m.com. I think all of us want to hear on the street solution. What is my homeless brother going to survive? Homeless brother going to survive. He is not allowed even to ply his cycle rickshaw. When will all of you get to him? Interesting question, interesting question. And Mr. Sudhir Raheja, if he's there, I will ask him to chat. Otherwise I'll show him the slide again of Buka. This is a very interesting question. I really don't have, uh, I personally believe that we are extremely selfish people. The higher we go up, the more we become wrapped up in the money jacket. Me first, my industry first. How many times we have pity? How many times we feel sorry that as a society, we have not provided people who are begging on the street? How many times we go in our car, Mercedes or Maruti to feel that? If we have that feeling that something is wrong, there could be a system to support the government, to suggest the government. And government is doing a lot of good things, no doubt about it. And our current prime minister, without any hesitation, the kind of thing he has been doing, Mr. Narendra Modi, and I'm not a member of BJP or Congress, I'm a professional. But I can tell you the amount of concern for the downtrodden, homeless, poor people, what this minister, prime minister has done in five, six years is tremendous. And I would like you to really uh, appreciate that artificial intelligence in 1967. First job was artificial intelligence. And today I have zero idea what artificial intelligence means. And eight years in large scale computing came back to serve India in 1973, losing leaving all luxuries of the Western world at the age of 28. 
and thereafter I continue to put my best. Eight years I worked in Bukaro and DHL, but you are the future. I'm 75. You are the future of this country. You must be strong in your convictions to bring change. And with this, collectively, stakeholder management, we shall make India the most prosperous nation in the world. Dhaniwa.